The story of Harmony Montgomery is both tragic and deeply heartbreaking. At just five years old, Harmony endured years of abuse at the hands of her father, Adam Montgomery. This culminated in her life being savagely taken by him, an act compounded by his lies and refusal to reveal the location of her body. Although Adam Montgomery was found guilty, he is yet to disclose where Harmony's body is, prolonging the agony for those who loved her. The evil presence in this case is palpable, with no sign of remorse from Adam Montgomery. The tireless effort of the Manchester, New Hampshire Police Department, under the leadership of Chief Alan Oldenburg, has been a beacon of hope and dedication amidst the darkness. Their hard work and commitment to seek justice for harmony stands as a testament to their resolve and the impact of this devastating case on the community. Harmony's story is a stark reminder of the presence of evil in the world, but also of the power of persistence and the unyielding quest for justice. It is a somber reflection on the profound loss and the enduring strength of those who fight for the truth. Welcome to Gold Shields. Gold Shields brings true stories from law enforcement, the military, true crime authors, and first responders. Experience the dedication, danger, and emotional toll with the heroes themselves. These gripping tales of true crimes, true stories, and true heroes are all here on Gold Shields. Hey, Dan Murphy, back with Gold Shields, along with my partner in crime, Tom Smith. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, man. Very happy to be here once again with, uh, we keep saying it week after week, amazing guests. Amazing guests and amazing cases. Um, this case today that we, we're privileged to have uh, the man who oversaw and ran the investigation um, on the show is one that is... Uh, it's disturbing. I'm going to warn you before we start in it. This is a very disturbing, sad, heavy case. But it's one that, uh, in order to honor the victim and others like her, we need to tell. Right, Tom? Absolutely. You know, we just said it kind of before we came on the air. Sometimes there's just evil in the world. And this defines that. Uh, Harmony Montgomery was tragically killed, now we can say, by her father uh, in between around 2019. And the circumstances aren't just as easy as what I just said. You know, yeah, we've had cases like this before, unfortunately, in this country with parents killing their children. But this one is especially heinous and disturbing of what had happened. So without for any further ado, uh, we want to bring in Chief Alan Allenberg from Manchester PD. Uh, Chief, it is a pleasure and an honor to have you on our show. Welcome to Gold Shields. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, greetings from the uh, state of New Hampshire. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. New Hampshire is a beautiful place. I used to go up there every summer to an uh, area called Ringe, not far from Keene. I'm sure you're familiar yeah, with it. Yeah, western part of the state. So, Welcome back anytime. But again, thanks for having me on to uh, yeah, discuss this um, horrific, horrible case that um, no, these things don't have happy endings. It's, there's never... A good ending, um, but we're grateful for the sentence that we got yesterday. Definitely grateful for that. So take us to the case itself. You've been uh, the chief of the Manchester, New Hampshire Police Department for a couple of years now. Yeah, October of uh, 2020. Uh, yeah, a little over three years. Yep. yep. And you've got a long career in law enforcement. You want to tell us a little bit about how you got there? Yeah, I mean, I started my career in a community um, <clears throat> just next door here in Manchester in 1998. Um town called Goffstown, New Hampshire. I did about um, six years over there. My career initially at the beginning was interrupted. Um, I shouldn't say interrupted, but um, was significantly changed due to 9-11, um, which I'm sure you, I know you gentlemen are very familiar with. And um, <clears throat> I went back on active duty that night um, or that afternoon, and I did not return to the PD until um, the summer of 03. So did a Operation Noble Eagle mission stateside, and then finished that a month later, I uh, deployed my company um, when I was with the Massachusetts Army National Guard, pulled them over to um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Uzbekistan. Um, so did that from 02 to 03. <clears throat> when I came back from that deployment, I kind of 
had the itch to do a little bit more in police work. Goff Sound is a small community, very good to me. Got my, gave me my start in this profession. Um, so I applied to um, here in Manchester right next door, and I applied to New Hampshire State Police um, at the same time. Got up, got a conditional offer from both, and I flipped the coin. Um, what a way to do your life, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> heads Manchester and tails State Police, and um, here I am 20-plus years later. So I've been very fortunate. Um, still in the military, um, now a member of the New Hampshire Army National Guard, and um, I'm a brigade commander up here, Colonel, um, and I've just um, been fortunate to uh, been selected to be promoted to uh, Brigadier General um, sometime in the, in the future. So I've had two great careers, been able to serve my city, my my community, and my country um, for you know, over 30 years. So that's kind of where I ended up. Majority of my career in uh, Manchester was um, was patrol. I worked a lot of time on Miz. My my heart is in patrol. A um, little bit of time in detectives, and then I um, ended up deploying to Iraq in 2009, 2010. So my time in detectives kind of came to an end. Came back from that deployment, went back into patrol, and then um, took a promotional exam. Was never going to, to be honest with you. And I, but I started looking around, and I'm like, I worked for a lot of good bosses, but I'm like, mm, that guy's a sergeant. I could probably <laughs> could do that. Um, and then I've had people here that uh, looked out for me along the way, and then um, one day you wake up and you're the you're the chief. And of a, um, you know, for those that don't know, Manchester PD is a 272 sworn, so decent size, um, particularly by New Hampshire standards and New England standards, for that matter. Um, and about another 60 nods sworn, about 115,000 people, um, very diverse community, um, you know, 40 minutes from Boston, 40 minutes from the seacoast, 40 minutes from, or an hour or so from the North Country up in the White Mountains. So we're kind of centrally located in the state, um, a lot going on, um, we have our issues like most mid-sized cities, gun violence, drugs, homelessness that we're dealing with. Um, in this case here, Harmony kind of touches all three, you know, the, the homelessness, guns, um, and then and, and the drunk epidemic. So, Chief, you know, what a career. I mean, an amazing run. And, and like I said, most of uh, most cops take promotional exams because of who they see as, as bosses. And, you know, I know... Danny didn't do that, and I'm glad Danny became my sergeant. But anyway, that's another show. Uh, but that Brigadier General, I mean, the whole thing is just very impressive, and Manchester's lucky to have somebody like you. Uh, so, you know, we're going to get into to this whole horrible case. And I think the one thing that jumps out at me, I want you to start where you want to start, obviously. But the one thing that gets me and, and drove me nuts reading more and more about this was the length of time between disappearing and someone doing something. I, I mean, it's mind-blowing that that occurred, you know, about two years, you know. So let's, let's hit it. Let's, let's get into your role, how it popped up, how it came on your radar, and, and the case. Yeah, it hit our radar um, officially um, at the end of um, December of um, 20. I'm sorry, no, 21. Um, all these dates of like completely. Um, so December of 2021, when I held that New Year's Eve press conference, um, a couple of days before that, we had opened an investigation based off um, the inquiry or a complaint that we got from um, Harmony's mother, Crystal Sorry. Um that she had been allegedly um, pounding on a lot of doors, trying to get attention. Nobody was listening. Um, so Detective Jack Dunleavy in my juvenile division, um, he listened and kind of said, hey, what's, what's going on here? Um, something's up. And they brought it to me. And I, <clears throat> we initially, when I did that initial press conference, really the, the, the hope was, hey, let's get her face, let's get her name out there. Maybe she's with somebody that just went, you know, unreported or... Hey, maybe Adam Montgomery did have her, gave her to somebody because he couldn't care for her, never really communicated that. Or maybe, in fact, um, Crystal did have her, or, or whatever was going on. Um, my, so my hope was we do this press conference, and I, I really thought within an hour or two we'd probably get a phone call um, that, hey, we 
you know, time out, we have harmony. I'm so and so, and this is where we're at. And you know, come see her, or we'll bring her to you. Uh, and obviously, that that didn't happen. Um, so that took us into um, you know January of 22, and this from that night forward, um, you know, Jack and the rest of the team started working this um, in earnest, nonstop. Um, you know, trying to track down Adam Montgomery. Um, we're able to um, finally get a hold of him beginning part of January. Um, as you saw in the trial, you know, he was up in another state, made his way, way back down here in, in New Hampshire. We put out a bowl off the vehicle we thought we would be in, um, in patrol, came across that vehicle um, the morning hours beginning part of January. And, you know, he, he was asked, hey, where's, you know, we're just trying to check on the condition of harmony. At this point, really a check conditioning type call. Um, and he was, he was uncooperative right out of the gate. Um, you know, you know, well, some things along the lines, like that hey, you do your job. Um, you know, I'm not talking to you guys very, maybe you saw the body cam footage that they showed in court, but, uh, no audio, the judge would let the audio in. Um, but so then we, okay, there's something even more going on. Um, so we are able to obtain, um, an ex parte order, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, we served that with him basically saying, Hey, you have to, um, the court is saying that you have to hand over harmony. Um, just a, another step in the process to, you know, get it, honestly, get, get in his kitchen a little bit and let him know that, Hey, we're paying attention. We're on you. And he served that ex parte order. Obviously he doesn't produce harmony because he can't. And then the, shortly thereafter, we come up with the, um, the warrants for the assault, the second degree assault that you heard during the trial and child endangerment. Um, we were able to take him into custody and that's when he's been held since then. Um, so through all of this, um, you know, you, you have Kayla Montgomery, you know, his estranged wife. Um, you have this other girl that Adam's with, um, Kelsey, you heard, probably heard about her during the trial. Um, you know, she subsequently passes away. Um, so the wreckage that this individual leaves behind him is, is massive. Um, so a lot of, a lot of work being done. Um, and then we start looking at, you know, he's a career criminal. You know, if you, you see his criminal record, you heard Judge Messer mention it, that, you know, one of the worst criminal records she's ever seen. Um, going back to his time in Massachusetts. So credit to Jack and, and Detective Rahill and the others, they uh, okay, would be able to investigate and gain some knowledge about um, some gun crimes. Um, the way we knew, right, you have to, it, it wasn't making up charges, but the detectives really had to, you know, dig into everything to see what type of leverage we could gain. Um, so we were able to get those gun charges out of our career criminal, um, working with Kayla, um, trying to get her on on board, try to get her squared away. Um, a lot of ups and downs with dealing with her. Um, eventually she does come around. That took some time. Um, and I think we, we always thought that to this day, I still think like, you know, okay, we put some gun charges on him. You know, maybe he'll come around, maybe he'll talk. Um, he's just never, um, he's shown no remorse whatsoever, no soul. Um, it's, it's really, really disheartening. Um, but you know, with the gun charges, getting him convicted of those, um, I'm crib criminal that got him 30 plus years. Um, so we figured that, okay, now hey, maybe the time, maybe he'll, he'll take the opportunity to talk to us. Um, and you know, offers were made, um, Hey, let us know where, where she is. And we could probably, you know, work with the attorney general's office to, you know, less as much pain on you as we can. Um, and you, you know, I think the big thing about this trial, this case is, you know, he concedes prior to the trial to falsifying physical evidence in abuse of a corpse. So he's admitting that, but he stopped short of, I didn't kill her though, right? That's Kayla, even though there's no, that's a theory, there's no evidence to support that Kayla did it. Um, nothing that backs that up. So you drag your daughter around the city of Manchester for months in a bag, in a cooler, you stick her in a ceiling. Um, 
and but you did all those horrible things, but you didn't kill her. So if you didn't kill her, right, then why not tell us where she is? So maybe we can maybe we can dis disprove our you know, our theory. Maybe we're maybe we're wrong. And he was given yet another opportunity yesterday in court. I'm not sure if you got a chance to watch the sentencing, but Senior Attorney, uh, Assistant Attorney General Benegatti, the lead on the case, said, you know, the state will offer 35 right now for her body. Um, it will take a pause for seven days, give us the opportunity to conduct a search based off the information you provide. Then again, he doesn't take it. Um, so I don't know if he ever will. I really don't. So I watched... Um... I watched the coverage of last night in the courtroom and the look on his face of complete disconcern for anybody else other than himself was was not it's not one I've never seen before but it's always one that's very deeply disturbing at, at those moments I've even seen the toughest guys in the world crack break down and cry I'm being put in away for the rest of my life they always have that sense this guy was stoic as though he couldn't care about anything no. um Next level, but I do appreciate that's not a compliment. Yeah, exactly. That'd be calling him a nice thing. I tell you what, one thing I really do appreciate, and something that for the audience and listeners who who aren't detectives or investigators or police officers, with a case like this, I can appreciate what you and your department did. You've got a guy who is not cooperating in the disappearance of his own daughter. You go after him. You go after him with all the tools you can. And you gain leverage on him, and you did you did the right thing. And a guy like this, you don't have to create charges on. He's a walking penal code violation, looking for a place to happen, right? So he's got two more gun trials pending. Yeah. So you know what? You don't want you don't want to cooperate with us. It sounds like you guys did everything you could do to give him a chance to just have the decency to say where he put his daughter's body, so that she can be buried and have some some sense of peace, in a very small way. He wouldn't even do that for his own daughter. This no, and I don't know if he ever will. That's the biggest takeaway from this case for me. Um, I would love to see it, you know, her located and, and buried in, in my tenure. Um, I'm still, that's the priority. To, not for me, right? It's not about me, but for the team that worked it, for the family, um, for her other siblings, for her, her mom. You know, her mom, Crystal, she's had her struggles in life. Right, I mean the drugs, and you know she's um she she admits it. She doesn't hide from it. She doesn't hide from the mistakes that she's made. Um, and then she lost harmony. But you know, for all her mistakes and her troubles in life, she doesn't deserve this, right? Um, and I and I feel for um she probably saw the name during the trial Michelle Rafferty, who was Harmony's Boston mom for an extended period of time. Um, there's a special place in heaven for people like Michelle um, that provided some calm and peace and love to Harmony, you, you know, for a good part of her life, um, and have that had that taken away from her um, by a judge in Massachusetts um, who really screwed this thing up. Um, I've taken a lot of heat um, about being vocal about that, um, not so much from Massachusetts because. You know, Massachusetts Department of Children and Family Services, um, to their, in my opinion, to their credit, they did a review uh, and they completely owned it, right? We we screwed this up. They and issued a very extensive report. Um, so it, it's nice to see that. Um, so hopefully they'll take steps to um, make sure it doesn't happen again. But internally in my own state, um, yeah, I took some, I was vocal about um, some failures of some other state agencies relative to Harmony. Um, you know, to a point where, hey, chief, you need to you need to tone it down, um, not from within, um, but more, but why? Why? I'm not. I'm not. It's not personal. It's not. And I fully recognize that. Hey, sometimes as a police department, every police department, we make mistakes, but we want law enforcement to be transparent and open and change our ways and, and do all these things that we've embraced on the heels of many events across the country. But when I want another state agency to do the same, um, it, it's met with like, well, no, how, not, your, not your lane, chief. Um, that, that's what's really frustrating to me.
extremely frustrating. And I, I've kind of learned to just live with it um, and hope that behind the scenes and some of these state agencies that things are underway to make sure this doesn't happen again. But Harmony is not the first child in the state of New Hampshire to fall victim to these type of circumstances. And you know what? We're, we're certainly, uh, we're going to touch on all this again in, in a minute. Uh, and primarily because of me watching the press conference you had after he was found guilty and the emotion that you had into everyone who was responsible and failed Harmony and all that. I want to get to that in a minute. But first, I want to not to over, over horrify this, but I think it's important in this case to everyone listening and watching of, of how much of a monster this guy was. Uh, if you can, take us through what he actually, like what happened. What were the circumstances of what you believe, you know, was the crime and the murder of this five-year-old little angel? Who, yeah, they were, just... um, they were transient. Well, they were living in a home on the west side of the city. They got, you know, they got evicted out of there. Um, ended up um, living out of their car um, kind of on the, on the other side of the city, uh, on kind of the north end of the city um, in an apartment complex, living out of the car with their other two children at the time. Um, you know, Harmony, um, you know, clearly wasn't, um, you know, we come to find out that, um, he didn't have a lot of love for Harmony. Um, she reminded him of uh, her mom, of Crystal. Um, she was having some um, accidents, um, you know, peeing her pants, um, some bowel accidents. Um, you know, she, it got to the point where, you know, Kayla, the other two kids, a lot of stress, um, drug use going on, and uh, they were driving um, to a Burger King. And, you know, according to Kayla, um, that, you know, Harmony had another accident and um, Adam had had enough. Um, and he reached back and, um, and punched her in the head um, several times over so she was lifeless. Um, the car breaks down and they have to have a, um, a tow truck come, but they put a, put a blanket over her. It's pretty sick stuff. Um, and then they... The next thing you know, she's in a bag, and that bag is uh, removed from the car while the car is towed. Um, and then they go back to the same complex that they've been kind of squatting in. Um, and one of Adam's um, counterparts, if you will, that lived there had a car that um, he allowed them to stay in um, for a period of time with Kayla, the other two kids, and uh, Harmony's dead and lifeless body. Um, and then from there, that's where the saga just continues. Um, they end up um, securing some housing. Um, and then they end up at a uh, family's in transition place at some point. And, um, you know, obviously at this point, you know, decomp starts to set in. Um, so she ends up in the ceiling. He puts her in a bag and a ceiling um, at this family's in transition place. Um, maintenance records show that some people start to complain about an odor. Um, maintenance folks show up, can't locate anything. Um, and then when we go, um, follow, you know, the fast forward and we get the investigation, we find out they're living at fit there. They had been. And the detectives go over there on a Saturday and you know, the smell of death, right? I mean, we've all smelt it. You know what it is. Um, and they go into this room and immediately the detectives are like, smell that? Um, and when you look up, you get on a ladder and they remove the ceiling tiles. Um, and the detective sticks his head up there and he's overwhelmed with the smell. Um, obviously, she's not there, but you can almost see the stain. Once we take the ceiling down, you can see the stain of the, almost in the shape of her bag and the body. Um, and she had been there for a period of time. Um, he was working at Portland Pie um, Pizza Place in the downtown of uh, Manchester. Uh, it was like a cook or a dishwasher. Uh, at one point, he had told Kayla to um, bring Harmony in the bag um, there. Uh, he kept her in the um, the walk-in freezer at Portland Pie for a little, for a little bit. Um, then they also lived at another address um, 
on Union Street here in the city. Um, kept her there. Um, at one point, took her to the west side of the city in a cooler. Um, kept her outside um, at a relative of Kayla's. Um, so they, they moved her around the city um, for an extended period of time. Um, and then the Union Street address was where, um, you know, so some kind of, you know, dismemberment or um, cutting up of Harmony um, allegedly probably took place. Um, we did search that address extensively with the FBI uh, evidence recovery team. Um, so just when you hear those things, um, it's it just as we kept learning more, it became more and more disturbing as to what he did to this little child. Um, I don't, you know, Kayla is who she is, you know, she ended up cooperating with the state. Um, but I, you know, very, she was abused. So there is something, you know, there, that, that is real. I think when my uh, women are being abused in this type of situation, I think we, have, we have to be compassionate to that. I don't, none of us have ever been in a situation where they were, we're dragging around a, a dead little girl, um, and I'm being physically and mentally abused by the, the, the individual that did it. Um, the fear sets in. Um, they have two other kids, and then another one that that she has to worry about. Um, so she, you know, she did her time. She's still in prison for her perjury. Um, she'll probably never see her three kids again. Um, so her life is in complete shambles and upside down. Um, it just it, the horror goes on and on. Yeah. Harmony Montgomery, if you look up online to the audience. You'll see a picture of a bright, vibrant, happy young child. Despite what she was put through as a child, she had a positive, up, uh, upbeat way of looking at life. She had only the use of one eye. Am I right? She did have some uh, some eye problems. Yeah. Right now, this is a you girl. You see it in the yeah. This is a girl who, despite all the challenges in life, was a sunshine, a ray of sunshine to people that she met. Tell me something about the city of Manchester and how they have dealt with this. What is the public? response been to something like this yeah i think um you know initially um i think it was oh, okay this will this will sort itself out and what really i think struck the community um really shook it was when the um our arrest affidavit um became public and people had the opportunity to read that um and i think that also you know highlights this job um, and for the public to read something like that and like, Hey, this is something, unfortunately that men and women in this profession across this country are dealing with every day. And yes, it shakes your conscience and you get to put that affidavit down or you get to delete it. Um, and our cops don't get to do that. Our detectives don't get to do that. Um, and I think the kind of the outpouring of support, um, uh, for the police department, uh, for harmony. Um, I'm still sitting on a, a lot of um, reward money, um, about 160000 that was donated by the community to locate anybody with information. Um, that still sits there. Um, but yeah, the community definitely um, got behind this little girl. And you know how these cases go, right? I mean, it's ups and downs in terms of how much it stays in the public eye. Um, I think an important part of this is, um, you know, I personally use the media as an ally. Uh, it's been my approach. Um, they've been great with this case. They've been respectful. Um, they did it. They covered her case with dignity and did a really nice job of keeping her face, her beautiful little face out there, um, and not so much making it about um, Adam Montgomery because um, he's he doesn't deserve an ounce of attention. Um, of course, he's going to get it because that sells. Uh, makes good news stories, but I'm thankful to the media. Lady Law Shield, led by Bridget Truxillo, stands as a formidable ally for law enforcement officers facing the daily challenges of discrimination, intimidation, and harassment in the workplace. Founded by Bridget, a former Florida deputy sheriff who defied the odds to ascend from an undercover narcotics detective to a SWAT team operator. Her firm understands the unique struggles and complexities of law enforcement careers. With a deep-rooted commitment to defending the rights of those who protect and serve, Lady Law Shield specializes in employment-related matters tailored specifically 
for law enforcement and first responders. Whether battling unjust treatment, advocating for fair treatment, or navigating complex legal issues, they are steadfast in their mission to empower and protect those who dedicate their lives to public safety. Trust Bridget Trixillo and Lady Law Shield to be your unwavering advocate in the pursuit of justice and fairness in the workplace. Go to LadyLawShield.com to contact Bridget and have her in your corner. That's LadyLawShield.com. You know what? I didn't mean, I, you know, you can just tell what this case means to you when, you know, X amount of years later and you're describing it, you know, I can see it in your face, Dan can see it in your face, hear it in your voice. This hurts, you know, for everyone out there. And you just summed it up. And one of the reasons I wanted you to describe what happened to, to her was exactly what you said. This job, we've said it so many times, is not easy. It is extremely hard case by case by case. It's more difficult when it's a child. There's a child involved. There's an extra little push. There's an extra motivation because that person could have never defended themselves. And, you know, you hear what happened. And I think it was important to do that because it shows what the drive that you guys had, you, you know, your team not stopping. Uh, and we've all been involved in cases where you know who the bad guy is, but it's a matter of just getting there. You know it, you know it in your heart, everything in front of you, in your bones. And it's just the process, the process is the process, you know, of getting there. And that hurts sometimes, but you guys didn't stop at no, any I think time. With, um... I think what really still bothers me about this case, and, I, and who knows, right? Probably five, ten years from now, it may bother us more. I don't know, right? You know, when this, whenever this stuff hits us, you hear that a lot about when people retire, and you know, the job affects people at different points in their life. Um, but with this one, in talking to, you know, I think it's important to highlight when you're trying to investigate these type of crimes and you're dealing with the clientele that you are that ran with these with Adam and Kayla, um, it becomes even more difficult um, due to their dependency, due to how whatever else they got going on in their life. But what really struck me was the level of um, or lack of cooperation from some of these people that um, they affiliated themselves with. Um, like, what, what, Is there not a line that you people all cross? I mean, I'm, I'm, I kept saying over and over, this is a five-year-old girl, and I'm like, I have to beg in, in for people to come forward with information, um, viable information, because I, I still believe, you know, potentially, um, there could be somebody out there um, that he may have shared her location with. Um, you know, these people talk, right? You know, I need drugs, I need this, I need whatever I need to, to get myself get my fix um and that part of me still thinks that you know somebody else out there other than him knows where um she is and i'm not based out on anything it's just my gut um and if that that if that person or persons exist and they still haven't come forward then what what kind of world that we live in it um i what what bothers me the most is you know the fear that this girl probably that she had um being around him, um, constant living in fear, um, the the abuse, and the person on this earth that's supposed to protect um, this little girl is, is a parent, um, and you know maybe I, maybe I would I, I would gain a shred of respect if we got a call that said hey he's ready to he's ready to do the right thing. Um, I I would acknowledge that. I, I truly would. I would acknowledge that publicly that, that you know what, finally he, he he's trying to make a little bit of right out of something that's horribly, horribly wrong. Um, so I hold out that hope. I really do. One of the things that really struck me is you mentioned earlier the first interaction you guys had, your department had. You had the bolo out for him. You're looking for the girl. You pull him over. At this point, it's a wellness inquiry. Where is she? Is she okay? And he comes off arrogant, indignant, uncooperative, typical perp, as we like to say, just 
Right. Right then at that moment, I know how Tom and I feel about this, and I think it's a pretty universal thing for cops and detectives. Right then at that moment, it's like, you just made yourself a suspect, number one, and number two, it's my life's mission to bring you down. Because there's a five-year-old girl who, if nobody else in this world cares about her, we do. And that's I know- That's exactly how they handled it. Well, um, that's a testament yeah. to what they are. They're professionals, because that's how professional cops deal with stuff like that. We got a place yeah, in our heart for those guys. Kids. Yeah, I didn't worry about them. Um, you know, they got a long way to go in their career. Um, this is probably, hopefully, the worst case they ever have to work. Um, but I know when I'm gone, um, you know, Detective Dunleavy and Detective Ray Hill and the others, they got a good 10, 15 years to go. They'll stay on it. They absolutely will. They'll move on to other stuff, but if they get any call or tip, they'll get, they'll get on it in a minute. Uh, we like to say, hell hath no fury like a pissed off cop. You piss us off? <laughs> and I'm, uh, For a little kid? I mean, I tell you, yeah. the, we have stories of, of people we work with go to the ends of the earth to get you. It's not disparaging other victims of adult, you know, adult victims, as you know, but, um, you know, sometimes those things, you know, you know, people say, well, you know, gang violence, drug violence, okay, that's, that's part of that life. And, you know, this girl did it wasn't her life um my my i wish so much that she that she was never taken away from michelle rafferty um her foster mom because on june 7th she'd be 10 and probably be even more vibrant um and living a great life with um with michelle well that goes into kind of what i wanted to, to head on you know i watched your your press conference after he was found guilty and it was emotional it was raw uh for sure because you had just i think walked out of the the courtroom and you know you were very mindful of, of thanking the team and all that but one 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 moment stood out the most of me when you started kind of leading people or letting people know there are more people that are responsible for this and one person was like oh no the guy responsible is and you're like no <laughs> and you just blew that person completely off, which I was like, wow, that's a pissed off cop. Yeah. That's a cop that's like, that's the, no. one, that's the moment I took a lot of heat for. Yep. But you yes. were right. You were right in your I'm, emotion. Yeah. Sometimes I'm, I'm guilty of um, getting too emotional, but I'm, that's just who I am. And there's no change in that after 25 years doing this job. Um, it, it, it is what it is, but that's the moment where, um, yeah, I received, um, you know, I'll, I'll call it a phone call um, from outside of the police department, um, basically telling me that hey, you need to um, you need to stop pointing fingers the way you point them. You know what? Ruffle feathers if you have to. If the feathers need ruffling, this is a five-year-old girl. Let's all get over ourselves, get over our agencies and all this other pride and who's got wounded egos. It's a five-year-old girl here that a system, one piece of the system, significantly failed her, and now she's dead. And if you can't speak up, and that's one of the things we, we like to highlight in the show is that cops are human beings. We have families. We have people we love. We see this happen to anybody. We take it personally. People always I mean, say- heard you... at the trial. Yeah. It came out of the trial that, you know, when, when confronted by DCYF, he says, well, I, I gave her back to her mother. Right, and they they attempt to um, make they make a phone call to Crystal, and that's where the follow up started. Stop. Right, I, I just I'll never accept that. That so that that's okay. That that's why we're that's why we were two years behind on the investigation. Right, was Harmony already dead? Yes, but you know how much evidence. How much was lost that from, from, you know, total stuff, cell phones, um, phones being changed out, thrown away, you know, exchanged, all that evidence that we lost then because nobody decided, hey, maybe we should, I don't know, take a ride down to see Crystal. Maybe we should have the PD down there do it. Um, Maybe we can ask Manchester PD to do it. I don't like 
Imagine if a cop made that error. Oh, right. Unbelievable. They'd be standing out in front of my PD. That's my only point with this whole thing. And it's not personal, but like, I just don't, I, I can't get over that. Um, you know, and the, the check that was done, um, when Harmony was alive, that follow up from DCYF where, um, you know, Harmony's in a car driving away with Adam, um, and with at the time probably a significant black eye, and that's satisfaction for a, a a welfare check on her that she's driving away in a car. I just don't, and I'm not looking for people to be strung up and hung here, but again, that's what I get back to: accountability for police. I hold them accountable, hold them accountable. Then I'm looking for a little bit of accountability, and I get hey, I get a phone call. Hey, shut your mouth. You That's wouldn't sad. shut your mouth if no the table can turn. So oh, no, you better believe it. No, they'd be all over your department if uh, if one of you guys had had dropped the ball on that. And uh, rightfully so. And rightfully so is right. This this is kids we're talking about. This is our job. And it's anybody who's in the food chain of looking out for children, children administration services, child welfare services, the courts. All of it has a massive, massive responsibility. You can't. You got a zero zero fail rate. You can't screw this up. And they got good people there, right? They all, I think those people get into that line of work. They're well attended. Um, they care about kids. Um, and they set out every day to do the right thing. Um, but if we're not going to, and I, I, I'm going to assume that internally they hopefully made some changes. Um, but I, I also think they could probably gain back a lot of trust and faith from the community that they serve if they, kind of went public with it and you know what i mean like hey we we recognize that perhaps we, we made some mistakes um get out in front of it say hey, this is what we're going to do to correct it um you can have those conversations with me all day long but it's the public that they're interacting with that really needs their trust frankly when you come in and potentially take some of these kids away and you know why because this isn't the first and last one it's going to happen again you know maybe not to this extent and this extreme but you're gonna, there's going to be another case of a question that comes up of where is she? Is she with the right parent? Should we go check? That's going to happen again. It's probably happened to dozens of times since this case. And, you know, like you said, accountability is everything. You have a job to do. You have responsibility, you know, in that job. And whether you like it or not, you know, whether it's, oh, my God, I got to get in a car. Yeah, that's your job. And the other thing it does, and you brought up a, a great point. If immediately people start looking at it, that puts an immediate pressure on Adam. Now it's more of a, a pressure situation where he can slip up. He can now, you know, maybe make a statement, you know, recover her body instead of, you know, X amount of years later. You know, evidence is right there. The immediacy of, of acting, and that's the part where, where us as detectives, chiefs, you know, investigators rely on, you know, and if we can get there even quicker, it makes a better case. He he, he probably thought for two years, hey, I'm 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 coasting here. I'm having a good run. Um, you know, so till things go sour with him and Kayla, um, and then he gets with this other girl. Um, who knows what she knew before she died? Because you know they probably had some type of conversation. These guys can't keep their mouth shut. They have the right to remain silent, but not the ability, except this guy when it comes to where his daughter is, to the courts and to the cops. But I can, if I was a predictor of anything, I would say during the course of his incarceration at some point, he's going to find somebody who's, before, before he gets killed in prison, if that happens because of the nature of his crime, and I am not wishing it, I'm just saying it's the nature of incarceration in America, the certain hierarchy of crimes. And when you're beneath the gutter like this guy is, you know, so he's going to talk to somebody. He's going to mention this to somebody, whether it be in a bragging way about how smart he is that he got over on the cops or in a moment of humanity. Somehow he's going to say something. And that person is going to do what every jailhouse snitch has ever done, which is look for a lifeline. And that lifeline is a phone call to the DA's office. I got something for you. And if that happens... We've had some of those wasted phone calls. You know, like, hey, yeah. I think I have something. Then we meet with him and like, Really, man? Like, yeah. That's, you, you call this here for this? Like, yep. Oh, nice try. Desperation. I've talked to more than one person incarcerated looking for an out. Looking for an out, and they give you something that they pray is right, and they're guessing. Yeah. 
Yeah, who knows? Maybe when he's, you know, I think he's eligible for parole um, when he's about 108. I'm doing the math right, 110. So, you know, maybe he gets connected inside with some programs. Who knows? And maybe, you know, find some type of clarity. Um, but maybe the Department of Corrections can, I don't know. Well, um, I'm going to hold up, hope though. Because right now, that's all we got. We're still actively, you know, doing some, um, getting ready for some potential future ser searches in the areas we've already done um, with some drone stuff. Um, try to get a little more creative there with some, there's some nonprofits out there that do work around uh, drone stuff. Um, so we're, you know, we'll get out and what the intel and what whatever else we can gather, we'll get out there and walk the ground again, um, make sure we're not missing something. Um, the massive area, and again, what we're going off of is based on um, the limited intelligence we have and information about where he could have potentially taken. So that's that's the that's the challenge. So let's walk through. Let's take let's let's talk about yesterday uh, and the sentencing. Uh, how was the sentencing yesterday, and what did this maniac actually get? So you got total fifty six years, uh, forty five for the for the homicide, and then you got the um, believe it or not, abuse of corpse in the state of New Hampshire is a is a misdemeanor. Um, so you got twelve months for that, and then for the um, sec second degree assault and the falsifying, you got. Um, three and a half to seven on those for the class A felonies that got him right up to about 56 years. Um, he's already doing 35 for the gun for armed career criminal times two um, that we convicted of him last year. So that, again, that puts him uh, about a, about 108 before he'll see daylight again. So he's, it, it's essentially a life sentence. Um, we do have pet, two more pending um, gun charges on him. Um, you know, the attorney general's office is going to have to make the decision. Um, is it really a smart use of resources, um, to, to bring those to court? Um, what's, what's really going to be the end game. So whatever decision they make on that, we'll, we'll, we'll respect it. Um, if they choose not to, I could fully probably understand why they, why they wouldn't do it. Um, he was, he didn't want to be in the courtroom. That's the other part of this whole trial, right? Um, you know, he's, he's there for day one of jury selection. Um, and after that, you don't see him again for the entire length of the trial. Um, that's his right, you know, not, not, not to be there. But if you remember, if you rewind when he was convicted of the, um, of the gun charges, he made a comment at the end that he looked forward to his upcoming trial um, to refute, refute these ridiculous charges, I'm paraphrasing that he, you know, that he killed his daughter. And then you don't show up for your trial. Um, yes. Yep. And then yesterday he tried to create a little more drama. Um, he didn't want to be there. Um, so the judge, um, issued an order that he was to appear, um, that told the department of corrections that he used to appear, um, with all, within necessary means without, you know, if he was to resist coming out of his cell within reason. Um, so he did show up, but he, um, he didn't want to be in the courtroom um, for the impact statements. You know, it almost goes without saying somebody who kills their own child in such a brutal, bullyish kind of way would be a coward at that moment when their own fate is being decided by a judge. And that that's typical. That's I mean, you can see that. This guy is, doesn't even have the spine to stand up at that moment. But I just want to... He was the judge, too. Yeah. Um, you know, she asked him, do you understand the sentence or do you have any questions? And, you know... He, he, his response was, nope. Yeah. So, Real judges don't like that. Oh, no. That's the one person Shit. in the world you never want to take off as your judge. I've seen that before. It does not work out well for you. No. No. So, you know, I just want to uh, thank you, first of all. Um, this is a story that is, is disturbing but needs to be told. We said that earlier. And thank you for the professionalism of you and your department in not giving up and going tenaciously after this guy on behalf of this innocent five-year-old girl, Harmony, who is now lost to the world because of the savagery of her biological father. The terror she went through in life, the unnecessary pain shouldn't be suffered by anybody, but you did everything you can do, and I have 
confidence that your department under your leadership and then even beyond is going to find the full answer here. Because I, you, so. I think you will. I pray you will. And I have real good confidence because what I see in you uh, is, is, um, is a bulldog, is somebody who will not give up. And that's what this work is all about on behalf of kids, especially. So thank you for the job you did. You did honor to our profession. Um, and uh, I, I just want to wish you all the best in everything else that you do with the department and beyond because uh, you're a special man and we really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, I got special people working here. So I, um, I'll pass it on to them. Uh, thank you, Dan. And Tommy, thank you as well. Um, maybe we'll meet somewhere in the future. You never know. We're going to talk about that as soon as we're done with the show, so don't go anywhere after yeah, we're here. done. Uh, and, you know, just to echo Dan, uh, you're a credit. You're, you're what makes our job special. You're what makes other cops proud of what they do because of things that you do. And leadership is not a given, okay? Leadership takes work, it takes time, and it takes a special person to be a leader. And you hold all those traits. So I thank you that. for thank everything, you everything you've done for Harmony uh, and for this case and, and just being that guy. So thank you. And of course, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure to be on. Thank you. So, you know, like we always do, Dan, uh, you know, our guests again, in a horrible case that we just said, you know, needed to be told and, and you know, the, uh, the team aspect of, of getting done what needed to get done had to be told today. So thank you all for that. And as we do always at the end of our show, pray for our law enforcement officers out there. With Police Week coming up, uh, pray for the sacrifices that are done, both on a physical level and mental level. This job's not easy. It's very hard. So when you see a cop somewhere, thank them. Give them a pat on the back. Give them a wave on the street. Uh, and pray for Harmony. You know, she's at peace now as a little angel in heaven, uh, finally rid of pain and, uh, you know, looking down on all of us. So pray for her. Good point. Yeah, well put. For my partner, Dan Murphy, for Chief Alan, Alan, Alan Aldenberg, I'm sorry. There you my go. tongue got all twisted. Uh, English is thank, a second language to Tommy. He grew up in Manhattan. You know, I, I, yeah, sorry. I'm a Northern Manhattan kid. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you to all. Uh, remember, uh, hit our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Gold Shields. Hit that subscribe button. Follow us on all our uh, audio platforms, our, our website, thegoldshieldshow.com. For Dan Murphy, for Alan, for Tom, myself, thank you so much for joining us. Everyone stay safe. We'll see you all soon.